Hi, everybody, and welcome to a special edition of Two Opinionated, where I'm thrilled uh, to have with me today actor producer Peter Melman. So, welcome, sir. Thank you. Good to be here. <laughs> yeah, we really appreciate you coming on the uh, on the show. I I sent you a message on on Facebook, and you were really uh, gracious to uh, to reply because I know that it's always dicey to reply to anybody on Facebook. Yeah, I, I've gotten to the point now where I get friend requests on Facebook and, you know, like, if they don't seem like somebody who will actually kill me, you know, like, <laughs> you know which, me which means that, like, when people, I knew it, when I noticed that they live in Los Angeles, I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's too close. <laughs> yeah. Well, we would really have to have a grudge. We'd have to go yeah. clear across country. <laughs> Well, you know, I, 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 I always believe that you should never give up on a grudge. You know, so. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> There's no statute of limitations. On <laughs> so I, I, wanted to, I wanted to start by asking you, because I, I didn't realize this, but I, I thought it was really interesting. You, you actually started out as a sportscaster or a sports writer. Sports writer, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. a sports writer at the Washington Post. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Did you cover all sports, or did you have a, a special, uh, you know, one sport that you were covering? Well, I, you know, I was just out of college, and you know, so like I was, you know, just whatever assignments they gave me. So one day I might be, you know, doing an article about you know college football, and you know, the next day I might be covering, you know, a Baltimore Orioles game because back then, you know, that was before Washington got its team back. So right. You know, we did have some focus on Baltimore Orioles. So, um, yeah, I did, uh, you know, either coverage or helping with coverage on all different sports. I yeah, mean, even, that's even lacrosse. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm surprised they had that uh, back then. Like, like in West Virginia, we just started getting lacrosse sports in high school probably in the last 10 years. Well, I went to University of Maryland, and which is nine miles outside of Washington D.C. And yeah. you know they were always like in the semifinals. Yeah, they had a good team. tournament, they, and you know they just won it again a couple of years ago. And so the trust was kind of big. And also there was a guy there um, by the name of Frank Erso, who was considered, yep. you know, other than Jim Brown, the football player, he was yeah. the greatest lacrosse player ever. So you know it, it did have um kind of a standing in the washington area yeah that's really cool did you play any uh, uh sports you know i'm just a basketball nut you know but i'm a real i didn't you know i'm not i didn't play varsity you know in maryland right, but, right. Uh, but you know i'm a real street player you know, <laughs> you know I, grew, I, grew, I grew up in new york and you know and i i'm a very schoolyardy kind of player got a, got a good crossover i'm guessing uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I have an excellent crossover. I always said that if you, if you gave me as much time as I needed, maybe, maybe a minute to set up and get everything adjusted and stuff, I might hit the shot. I, 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 the shot doesn't look too bad as long as nobody's near me and I got plenty of time. Oh, see, I, I can't shoot unless someone's all over me. <laughs> You're a pressure shooter. Yeah, I, 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 you know, like I, I modeled my, my later game, I modeled kind of on Kobe Bryant. <laughs> you know, I interviewed him. I, I interviewed Kobe for this show I did, Peter Melman's Narrow World of Sports. Yeah, yeah, I, I was and, looking some of those up. It's on YouTube. Yeah, and, um, you know, at the end, I, you know, Kobe was just so great to hang out with, and he was so much fun. At the end, I told him that, uh, I told him that I've stolen all his moves. And he goes, <laughs> he goes, that's fine. You could jack my game all you want. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's hilarious. Did, did you get a chance to do any one-on-one with him? No. I did a little, <laughs> I did a little, I did a little one-on-one with Blake Griffin. Really? Yeah. How'd that go? Well, I set it up so he would block every one of my shots. <laughs> so I'm like, I like crossover and spin and do all this turkey jerky stuff and then just like 
shoot and make sure that without leaving his feet, he would just swat my shot. He well, was you wanted to make him look good. Yeah, he, he's also like the funniest person in the history of the world. So he's, I've heard that he's got a good sense of humor. He is a riot. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that. Uh, and very low-key, you know, very low-key. He never, you know, he doesn't laugh. He doesn't raise his voice. You know, I mean, like, I, you know, the whole point of doing those interviews was to ask the kind of questions that ESPN would never ask. You know, so right. I asked Blake Griffin, I said, you know, you, one of you, you're biracial. You have one white parent, one black parent. Do you ever, did you ever worry that, you know, the white half of you would hurt your chances of having an NBA career? And, you know, totally deadpan, he just said, oh, I used to cry myself to sleep. I used to wonder, like, why? <laughs> why do I have to be half white? Why can't I just be guaranteed to be in the NBA? I mean, he was, <laughs> he was so funny. It was unbelievable. And this oh, was that's great. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's great. I've, I've always heard that with him. Yeah, did, did I see that you, uh, that you did a, a show with uh, Howard Cosell? Yes, I, I worked on his show Sports Beat, which was kind of like a forerunner to the um, to the show that Brian Gumble does on HBO. Yeah, Real Sports. It was kind of like that, a sports journalism show. Um, yeah, I remember that show. That's I mean, it's been a little while, but I I remember yeah. that show. Yeah, I worked on that show for uh, two and a half years. Yeah, what was that like working with Howard Cosell? Because he's such a distinct personality. It was the greatest. I mean, he yeah. was you know he was so funny, and there was so much heat around him. You know, I mean. This is a guy who every year he would be chosen amongst the top 10 most admired and most hated people in America. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, true. So, so, you know, like, and, you know, but, but the people who mattered, the actual athletes, they all knew that he would give them a fair shake. Yeah. You know, they'd see what he had done with, you know, Muhammad Ali and all these other athletes, and they knew that interviewing with Howard was safe because he would be fair. <laughs> yeah, so, that's right. You know, it felt like being in the center of the sports universe. It was really exciting. Yeah, yeah, he had the best voice. <laughs> well, yeah. not the kind of voice that would normally be on TV, but... Well, I'll say he had the most distinctive voice. I mean, yeah. he definitely would recognize his voice. He didn't have the voice or the face, and yet somehow he was the biggest... Somehow he made it work. And nobody's really picked up the torch. I used to no. That's uh, sadly that's true. I I used to love uh, Billy Crystal doing uh, Howard Cosell. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> back in the day. So um, I wanted to. You had kind of a strange entry into into the entertainment business. Um, you you hadn't written a screenplay, if I remember reading it right, but you got asked by Larry David to, to submit a script for Seinfeld. Yeah, I. Um... Before I moved to Los Angeles, I had met Larry David like one, two or three times maybe. And, uh, you know, we kind of got along, blah, blah, blah. And then I uh, bumped into him out here and he just said, I'm doing this little uh, TV show with Jerry Seinfeld. Maybe you could write a script. <laughs> and um, Did you know who Jerry Seinfeld was at that time? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. oh okay. okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I guess Larry you know, knew that I was a writer. And so he assumed that I had written scripts, but I actually, I had only written, you know, basically journalism stuff, you yeah. know, I'd written for magazines and newspapers. And um, I gave, as a writing sample that he would pass on to Jerry, I gave an article that I wrote in the New York Times. It was a humor piece with a little bit of bittersweetness, which is weird because Seinfeld, you know, didn't really go for bittersweetness. Right. But um, Jerry really liked the piece and they gave me a chance to write a script and, you know, through a lot of beginner's luck, it worked out well. And uh, next, next thing you know, I was loaded. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Did, did you have any, any thought early on that that show was going to be such a hit? Yes. Um, it's one of the few times I was ever right about anything. Um, yeah. You know, like when they liked my first script and they, you know, and they said to me, if we get picked up next season, you know, for a season, you know, you got a staff job. Yeah. I hung up the phone and had this immediate thought that my life was about to change because yeah. I thought the show was so great. Like I was so naive that I was thinking like, how could a show this good 
not be successful. Right. Yeah, right. But <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of shows, like, like you did, you did your own show yeah. uh, a little bit later, which I thought was hilarious. And, and right. it only lasted a season or two. Yeah, two seasons. Um, and, and, and that was like a battle all the way. So, you know. It, it was, was a very L.A. style. I mean, it was kind of a Seinfeld style type of show. Yeah. In, in L.A. LA. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, it was very eye opening because at Seinfeld, there was very little interference from the network or anything yeah. like that. And then, you know, I do this show with another network and, you know, it didn't take long for me to realize that, you know, a lot of television executives hated Seinfeld. They liked it as fans. Right. But as executives, you know, it broke all their rules. You know, the characters weren't likable. They weren't very right. nice to each other. They would make, you know, incredibly insensitive jokes. <laughs> and, you know, they hated that. So, um, you know, they would say things to me like, you know, he's not very likable in this scene. <laughs> And I would say, well, if you wanted likable, why did you get in business with me? Well, yeah, they had to know what they were getting. Yeah. <laughs> it was like mind boggling to me. And do you think, do you think that show would have done better today with all the streaming services and you got a lot more outlets today? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's kind of funny because, you know, the ratings that, got you canceled back then would put you in the top five now. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But, you know, I, I, I'm not exactly sure how all the streaming stuff, I, I don't get the economics of it, but, right. you know, it's wonderful. I'm glad they're doing it. But, you know, like, I, I, I'm, I'm amazed that Netflix can spend, you know, $5 million an episode for a half hour show. Sure. And it's profitable. I, I don't exactly get the economics, but then again, you know, that's not my field. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. Somebody gets it, I guess. But I know there's uh, there's almost too much good TV out there now. Yeah. I mean, like I was watching this show. I was watching, um, I was watching Bosch. Oh, I like Bosch. Bosch is great. I mean, it's yeah. really well done, well produced. And I'm, I'm looking at it. God, how expensive this must be with all these outdoor shoots and everything like yeah. that. You know, like on Seinfeld, I would in the beginning, you know, before it was that big, you know, I'd be concerned about, you know, writing something that would require a new set, you know, yeah. because that, that was expensive. You know, like in the episode um, with Terry Hatcher with the implant. Yeah. You know, I mean, I had to have a sauna scene, you know, right. so, so we took, so instead of, uh, I had that one sauna scene, but then instead of having the coffee shop, you know, where normal discussions would take place, I had yep. all the discussions take place in the sauna to save on sets. Yeah. You know, you had to actually think of the finances involved, you know, and, and then you look at Bosch and they're, they're shooting all over Los Angeles. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like stunning that they can do this. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. That, that's a very well uh, well done show. I started watching that. Uh, my dad was a fan of the books. And mm. so I, I hadn't read the books, but I said, well, I'll, I'll check out the show. And that, the, um, uh, the gentleman that stars on it used to be on Deadwood. I liked him on Deadwood. So I yeah. thought, well, I'll try it. And it's... Uh, yeah, I just finished the new season not too long ago. God, he is such a great actor. That guy. He really is. He's so good. Uh, yeah, very, very believable in that role. Yeah, man, Titus Welliver. Yeah, yeah, I couldn't think of his name, but yeah, yeah, yeah he's he's uh, he's uh, he's excellent. It's a good cast. They they have a good cast. Uh, yeah, the daughter is unbelievable too. I really like her. Yeah, I'd like. I'd like to, uh, I've reached out to her to, to have her come on the uh, program, but we're, we're still working on that. But yeah, I think she's wow. really talented. Yeah, she's, uh, she's really good. So, so your first script was, was The Apartment? Is that, yes. is that the one? Yes. Yeah, you did, you've done so many really, really, uh, uh, the, I think the best shows. I, I loved 
that one. And then the one that I think doesn't get as much, um, I don't know what you call it, press or, mm. or hype is the, uh, the shower head one. I love that shower head episode. Well, thank you. I love that one too. <laughs> that just cracks me up when they, when, uh, uh, Kramer comes in and the hair is kind of plastered down and they're, you know, they're looking at each other and say, oh, you do. <laughs> it, you know, the funny thing is I pitched that idea of low flow shower heads to Larry and Jerry like five times before they finally <laughs> went for it. It was just, it was just this idea that, uh, you know, I, I, by that point I had gotten comfortable enough to just say to them, look, I think you're making a big mistake not doing this idea. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Well, yeah, you had some pull by that time. Well, you know, I don't know about pull, but you know, <laughs> I had a, I I had enough to I I had enough just to you know, at least argue my case. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, well, talk a little bit about the uh, how that was to to write because it wasn't like a normal writers room, right? Like you didn't have a group of writers just sitting around all the time bouncing ideas off each other no you were pretty much on your own you know you we you would have to like you know come up with ideas and you know unlike most shows almost every character had a you know his his or her own story like every yeah. week and uh, so you'd have to pitch ideas to larry and jerry and you know larry would go yeah i like that one or no i don't like that one and then you, you know, kind of try to combine them together into yeah. one story. So it was very tricky and difficult, but, um, you know. I think it, that would be stressful. Would I mean, not, I guess it would be, it'd be good if, if, if they liked it, because then it'd just be your story. But, but then also, if they didn't like it, it it'd also be your story. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, most on, on all other comedy shows, you know, the, the whole staff, you know, the whole writing staff and the executive producers sit together and when they come up with an idea they like and they assign a writer to it, he's basically doing Mad Libs. Yeah. You know, because the entire story has already been mapped out and you just have to write the dialogue. And, you know, dialogue is really the easiest part of writing, a, a, you know, a comedy script. That's not so hard. It's the really? story that's difficult. Yeah, you I guess that's true. On, especially on Seinfeld where what you were really hoping for was laughs on lines that were not jokes. Right. You, know, you could get Kramer coming into the apartment and just putting down a hundred dollars and says, that's it. I'm out of the contest, <laughs> you know, and get a huge laugh. That's great because, you know, saying I'm out of the contest, that's not funny per right. se, but in the situation it's hysterical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 really uh, that's that's really interesting. So, what you know, what are some of the? Because I I'd heard a, a bunch of the kind of iconic uh, I don't know what you call it uh, moves or sayings from the show were your ideas. You know, can you name a few of those? Um, you know, I I've done um, double dipping, which oh, double dip the chip. Yeah. I mean, once, yeah. you, once you have the idea of somebody double dipping the chip, coming up with the term double dipping, you know, wasn't like a real tough one. <laughs> but, you know. Um, Hilarious. Yada, though. yada yada. I like that one. Oh, but, yeah. Yada, it, Brett, Brett actually told me to, to make sure I mentioned yada yada. Cause yeah, yada. That, that was because, you know, the funny thing about that is I had had lunch with a magazine editor like in the late 80s, and I noticed that she said yada yada once, and I was thinking, I never really heard that, that's kind of funny. And then like eight years later, I'm on Seinfeld, and it pops into my head, that conversation. <laughs> and I'm thinking, you know, that yada yada, you know, you can cover up all kinds of sins with that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, you know, that was really lucky. And, um, you know, and Spongeworthy and Shrinkage also. Shrinkage, yeah, sponge worthy. That, yeah, hilarious. Yeah, shrinkage, yeah, shrinkage is one we hear a lot. Yeah, a lot of people uh, bring that one up. Well, shrinkage was like the ultimate in creativity because I was having trouble with that script, tons of trouble. And then Larry one day says to me, "You know, I was thinking about your script, and uh, what if George goes in the pool, and it's cold, <laughs> and she sees him naked? You know, and it's been, you know, the, he's wet, and it's cold, and and I said." 
oh, you mean like shrinkage? <laughs> and Larry, and Larry in his genius says, yeah, shrinkage, and use that word, use it a lot. You know, yeah. Larry, <laughs> nobody, nobody was more positive of what he thought was funny than Larry, you know? Yeah. He's just, he's just. Well, his, his humor is, is, I mean, he's, he's a hilarious guy, but it's very dry. Yeah. Yeah. He's a, I, he, it's unique. It's unique. Everything that, uh, that he does, I, I've enjoyed Curb Your Enthusiasm, you know, if he's doing uh, Bernie Sanders or, or whatever show that he's, he's popping in on, you know, he's hilarious. Yeah, no, he's, he's great. Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty good. Um, sponge Worthy, so you wrote the episode The Sponge, uh -huh. um, but you also got to act in that one. Well, yeah, I had one, li I, I had one little scene, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I went back to watch because you're the pharmacist. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's pretty yeah. obvious once once you know that you can go back and guys like oh yeah yeah. That was, yeah you know we all did our little cameo you know like the you know half the time it was just basically like you needed somebody who was like maybe the right size you know like right. I was subway too yes and it was very crowded and they had a couple of people there who were like six three in the background they needed somebody slightly shorter than that and i'm six <laughs> one and you know i was walking by the stage and the director says oh we need you in this scene and next thing you know elaine is like having these thoughts and i'm like the cook you know i'm i'm right the, beside her. Uh, you know i'm the butt of all her like oh my god this guy smells and, you know. <laughs> being a disgruntled subway rider was not a stretch for me I was going to say, that's, uh, <laughs> up in that's New stellar York. casting right there. Yeah. <laughs> so what was it like? I didn't even realize uh, that uh, that Larry David had actually left the show there at the end. You know, mm -hmm. what was that like once once he's not, you know, around to kind of help with the writing? Um, it was very difficult, um, you know, and we did a lot more as a group at that point. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, like, you know, rewrites, we would do more as a group, whereas, you know, it, before, it, you know, it was better if just like Larry and Jerry would, you know, take some, yeah, take some of our notes and things like that, and then sit together and do a rewrite. So, you know, it got to be a little bit more group oriented. And, um, you know, it was difficult because, you um, yeah, you know, Larry had such a strong sensibility, and I, and you know, even I, I was feeling like the shows were a little too unwieldy. You know, like you know, a Puerto Rican Day Parade or something like that. You know, like right. I, just, I, I always liked episodes that were in line with Larry's original conception of the show, which was yeah. tiny slices of life. So, um, you know, I thought some of the episodes were getting a little bit more big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I could I could see that. And you know, that I mean I wasn't there for the final season. I left before the final season and you know, yada yada had been the last script that I wrote. Yeah. And you know, that was kind of a throwback episode because the ideas were really small. You know, they were yeah. you know, they was just like really slice of lifey kind of stuff. So um it felt like a good one to get out on. Yeah. Well you want yeah, end end on a good note. That's yeah, that's a that's great. What uh, so you weren't there for the final season? Obviously, the the ending's always been kind of controversial. I mean, what what's your thoughts on it? Did did you enjoy the final season? Did you know how um, do you feel I, about the ending? I thought the finale episode was was great. I don't understand. I never understood what you know, like what were people expecting? You know, I, right? You know, I mean, if you wanted to nitpick, and you would say that you know the three the four of them making jokes about a fat guy getting mugged was a little bit over the line you know it was a, like a little bit worse than anything else they'd ever done maybe right I at least you know entertain that argument but that doesn't mean that the whole episode is just you know, I, I don't know what people were expecting, or maybe the expectations were just impossible to live up to. But yeah, you, know, that's what you do you do a greatest hit, some, and you know something that basically encompasses the entire show. 
Yeah, I I, I kind of – that's the part I liked about it because if you were a fan, I mean, it basically did a callback to everything in the show, yes. you know, in the last two episodes. I always thought that part of part of what people didn't like about it is that they expected some kind of sentimentality finally. Right. You know, and um, as you've probably heard a million times, you know, the – you know, the show is, the show's motto is always no hugging, no learning. Yeah. And, um, you know, so we weren't going to start hugging and learning and just because we were saying goodbye. Yeah. Well, and, you know, now, I mean, it, of course, Seinfeld, every, everything that Seinfeld did was kind of ahead of his time. But now having those shows that don't end on a happy note or tie everything mm -hmm. up neatly, that's not that uncommon now, but yeah. you know, 20, 25 years ago, that, that was a big deal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, uh, there's a lot of, there's so much luck involved in, in a show, you know, succeeding like it did. Yeah. And, you know, and one of the, one of the lucky points is just the time when it took place because, you know, there's so much stuff that we did then that, you know, would be very dicey now. Yeah. 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 I, I, that's true. I, I, you might, you, you might get away with it on uh, a cable instead yeah. of a network. You know, so they, they do a little more I don't uh, know. racy. I mean, you know, the society is just, it's such a weird thing because it just seems like uh, everyone in the country is so hard to shock and so easy to offend. Yeah. You know, like everybody's kind of like sitting home just waiting for, to get offended. Wait, that that's not okay. <laughs> no, I, I wrote an article about that in the LA Times recently about how LA has completely lost its sense of humor. And what prompted the story is that I was walking my dog on uh, in Santa Monica, and the woman was playing with my dog and said, "Oh my God, he's such a great dog!" And then she says to me, um, "Did you adopt him?" And I just said, uh, no, um, you know, he's my, he's my biological dog. <laughs> <laughs> you know, which I thought was kind of funny. And that is then, funny. Yeah, and she says to me, well, you know what? If you went to a kill shelter, maybe you wouldn't think you're so funny. <laughs> come you on. Know, I'm like, oh, come on. Exactly. Like, really? You it's, know, and uh, I, it's just people are so impossible to deal with. I, I get the feeling a lot of people think that getting upset over something is actually doing something. Yeah. You know, they feel like yeah. they're accomplishing something just by getting upset. Yeah. It's funny. I think Obama said something about that recently about how like, you know, just talking about something is not actually doing it. Right. You know, <laughs> you know like he, he made this great point, you know, and uh, you know, I mean, just, uh, you know, somebody, I made a, I actually was at some function a while ago and, you know, said that, was talking about this. And I said, you know, you can't even make jokes anymore. And somebody goes, oh, you can't make jokes anymore. You know, try living in Somalia. <laughs> like, these are my, I'm like, these are my choices? <laughs> you know, humorless here or, you know. Oh my God! Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty <laughs> rough. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's probably it's maybe it's less you know correctness where you live, but it's pretty <laughs> no, it's the same. I mean, we at times get upset over different things, but it's yeah. It's, I think everywhere, uh, it's just become more and more. I'm I'm going to be upset no matter what. Yeah. You know, no matter what's happening or or what side you're on politically, it's you're going to be upset. I don't know. I, I, I'm like hardly ever offended. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm the same way. Time. Yes, I do. I don't care. Say what you want. <laughs> well, you don't have to agree, but you don't necessarily have to be upset about it. Yeah. And, you know, I started dabbling in stand up comedy in the last few years. Just, yeah. You know, and, you know, I've been doing it just, you know, and I love it, which is. You know, I'm not finding that hard because I don't have anything at stake. <laughs> you yeah. know, you know, comedy stand up is something you could be, you know, pretty good at if you don't feel any pressure. You know, right? <laughs> you know, but 
you know, like I'm just amazed at what offends people and what doesn't. Yeah. You know, like these young kids, they, they could talk like the most graphic sexual stuff and everybody's laughing their heads <laughs> off. And then somebody makes one like little joke about one tiny segment of society and everybody's like, no, you can't say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then it's too far. <laughs> yeah. you know. So you've done, uh, you've done some producing. I was curious, you know, how do you get into that? Does somebody just give you a call and say, Hey, would you like to help out with this show or this episode? You know, how does that work? That was basically how it worked. You know, my agents would yeah. get a call and, um, you know, most of the time I'd say no, um, because I didn't really want to leave my house. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, know, you, got, you know, after all that time, you get to the point where, why do I have to show up anywhere? <laughs> um, but uh, hold on, I'm going to hang up on someone. Okay. Okay. We um, have time for them. <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it just kind of came about by chance. And, yeah. you know, I don't even know what producing is. You know, basically everybody in the world is a producer. Yeah. You know, yeah, well, you, you do see a lot of different names show up as producers. So I was kind of curious. Can you, believe, about can you believe it? On the, on the credits, there's like five full minutes of different producers. <laughs> and these are just, and really what they are is investors. Yeah. You're most of them aren't yeah. doing anything. They're just writing a check. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's true. Well, so if, do you get a, a higher level of producer title the more money you put into it? Um, you know, I don't know how that works. <laughs> you know, to tell you the truth, you know, when I first started at Seinfeld, it was my, you know, my first time I was in the entertainment business. Yeah. So it was all strange to me. And I came up with two two kind of edicts for myself. Yeah. One was shut up and learn. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. And the other one was do your job and stay out of show business. <laughs> yeah, because like all that stuff, it, it just distracts from what your real job is. Yeah. You know, like worrying about what your agent is doing and that stuff, or worrying about this producer or this title. You know, like I didn't care about titles. You know, I, you know, like all the stuff didn't matter. And right. you know, it's really the way to go. You, I mean, you know, you really have to just focus on what your actual job is. Yeah, and yeah, I, mean, I, I think that's that's really good. It keeps you grounded. You yeah, know, it keeps you kind of focused. I, I think that's a good way to go. I mean, you know, especially writing wise, you know, like if you're not enjoying, if you, if you could enjoy the actual writing, that's all that really matters. You know, yeah. if you can like put everything into it and enjoy it, you know, because, you know, the second you write a script and you hit the word, you hit send on your computer, it's like driving a new car off the lot. It devalues <laughs> by 50% immediately. <laughs> Oh, shoot. Well, so what are you currently working on? Um, you know, I've just, I've written some novels. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you if you'd written, a, if you'd ever written a book. Yeah, I, I, I've written three. Well, one of them was a collection. I write a lot of op-eds and essays for yeah. newspapers and things like that. But And that one was just a collection of, of some of those. And I've written two novels. And, you know, one of them just came out, like, you know, just in time for the pandemic. <laughs> Perfectly planned. Yeah, little pandemic this, rating. Let's get this book out at the pandemic so I don't have to do any promotion or go anywhere. So like, <laughs> no book tour. <laughs> so, we could keep, so we could keep this book a total secret. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's actually about a book about what we've been talking about. It's about a sports writer who, you know, is a Pulitzer Prize winning sports writer at the Washington Post and you know, with an incredibly sterling reputation, who makes one slightly off-color joke that yeah. winds up on, you know, on Instagram and threatens to derail his entire career and life. It's called, very topical. Yeah, the book is called Hashtag Me As Well. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, we. I got to read that. We're always looking for some good reading material. Oh, very nice. They, yeah, this, how about is, that? this is the promotion that um, I wasn't able to do. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, be, uh, you better get some ready because it's, it's going to yeah. be flying off the shelves now. Yep. <laughs> I, you know, I, the half your audience just left and went on to Amazon. <laughs> We're okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> no, so that's great. Yeah, I, I thought with your writing ability that, that you probably had written some. Yeah, I'll tell you, I really love it. You know, I mean, it's hard to come up with ideas. I don't know how Stephen King does it, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's like, prolific. He, you know, the guy just blows me away. Yeah, I don't know how he does it here because it's like he's writing a a, a book a week. I, you know, something's always coming out. And and big books. <laughs> yeah. You know, and <laughs> yeah. He, and then he comes out with a book. Uh, his most recent book is four novellas basically yeah. in one. So they're like 200 pages each. Yeah, and, Brett's reading that right now. Yeah, I really, is he liking it? Because I, Yeah, I'm, he likes it. He likes it. He's just, he's, I'm like amazed at how brilliant that Well, and, and his, his son's a little bit like that. He's got a lot of books out. That, it must just run in that family. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah, people, I'd like to have just a little bit of that, but yeah, sadly I mean, no. Like, you know, these people who turn it out one after another, you know, like Joyce Carol Oates or, yeah. or John Updike or Philip Roth. I mean, like, I don't understand how they are so filled with ideas. Yeah. Well, and how do they keep them all straight? I, I've been yeah. mixing everything up. I mean, they must be writing a book and just go, oh, my God, I just got an idea for another one. I better finish this. <laughs> I guess, hey. That sounds like a pretty good living to me. If if that was something you were good at, yeah. it'd be miserable if you weren't very good at it. Yeah, no, it would be rough. It, it, I'm, you know, look, there's, there's a lot of people writing out there and, you know, now with all the self-publishing and everything. Um, but, you know, like I always say, you know, and, you know, I'm blessed to have, you know, the financial freedom to do it. You know, right. so I can not really worry about, you know, just to try to enjoy the work without um, worrying about what happens, you know. Yeah, with that's a blessing. With sales and stuff like that. Yeah, that's a, it's a total blessing. Have you tried, because we've, uh, we've had a few um, comedians on, have you tried uh, doing the Zoom stand-ups? Because I, I know some of them are actually doing those type of things. I haven't. I, yeah. I, should, I should at least just check one out to see what it's like, but I don't know. Somehow it just doesn't feel like it would be that great. But maybe. Well, you wouldn't get the laughter, you yeah. know, the the interaction that you. Although I, I guess they they um, they type. You know, you can you can mm. read the interaction, but you're not hearing it. I, I don't know how that would work. Yeah, I don't really interact with the audience anyway. So. <laughs> no, no, uh, no heckler. Uh, you know, responses. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't even like. To me, they're just in the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know I, I've been to several um, uh, Jerry Seinfeld stand-up uh, shows, and he always does a thing at the end where, you know, he'll offer to, to kind of answer just questions mm -hmm. coming from the audience unless somebody, you know, is uh, obnoxious. As soon as somebody's obnoxious, he just walks off the stage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, he, he can do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, have you stayed close with any of the cast or writers from the show? You know, I'm in touch, you know, especially, yeah. um, you know, Julia here and there and, um, yeah. and, and Jason. And, you know, I bumped into Michael Richards not that long ago. And, um, and I... Uh, and uh, uh, Rick, you know, Newman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and um, you know, so, you know, here and there I bump into people or, you know, and I keep in touch with some of them. And, uh, yeah. you know, Jerry and I email here and there. And, and uh, you know, I just gave, I, I gave Larry one idea for Curb that, 
uh, he once they start shooting, he's going to use. Uh, oh, very good. Yeah, he, that's that's that's. I I figured it. Yeah, I, I mean, life happens, so it's hard to stay yeah. super close. But I wondered if you stayed at least uh, in touch. Well, you know, it was pretty intense for uh, you know pretty intense bunch of years there. Yeah. You know, a lot of togetherness. Yeah. You know, set you know basically nine months a year of, you know. Yeah, set, that's a lot of time together. Yep. We had, uh, you know, I, I, I got to wrap up with you, but I, I, we had uh, Larry Hankin on, and and he mm -hmm. he w he played um, the fake Kramer, right? In the episode, I don't know if you remember that one when they were doing the pilot, he, he did, got the Kramer, and well, he he talked about uh, this when he was uh, auditioning for the the show that he did his his part and uh somebody told him you know i know what you're doing you're not you're not doing anything is what he said with that and and it it got it he he tells the story he got very upset about it because you know who is this guy telling me you know how to act you know i'm coming in here i you know i'm gonna act well it was it was larry that was telling him <laughs> how to act but he didn't know it was larry till till after Oh. <laughs> I was just curious if if you happened to be around when he was auditioning for that. Um, I wasn't. Yeah. I, I, I don't. Uh, you know, and that was another big episode. You know, that was a two-parter, and there it were was. a lot of roles. So. Um, yeah, yeah. That wasn't that wasn't your your normal? Uh, you know, I, it, one or yeah. two scene episodes. You know, I mean, I think the girl who I think it was the girl who played Elaine. You know, she was the wife of Doc Rivers. You know, oh, who really? Coaches, who coaches the Clippers? Yeah. So I mean, like it, the fun. It's funny what you think about what you remember about those things. Yeah. I just remember Doc Rivers being on the stage a couple of times, and it was so great hanging out with him. Yeah, that's that's really cool. I, that's uh, yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, we've been lucky enough to have a few people from the show. We had uh, Walter uh, Olkowitz that played, uh, he was the cable guy, you know, the right. kind of chases right. Kramer around. To, uh, he he speaks really, really fondly of those, you know, he the time he's been on set. Yeah, he's a funny guy. Yeah, I really uh, uh, enjoyed uh, uh, enjoyed talking with him. He had, he had some good stories about his time on set and stuff. So. <laughs> yeah, he was, funny. <laughs> he was funny. Well, and the show – the show really has held up. I mean, maybe not the technology, especially like the cell phones and stuff, but the show is, you know, you can w sit down and watch any episode. It's still funny. Yeah. I mean, you know, the funny thing is, you know, like I always say, the show is these little tiny slices of life and, you know, yeah. about human foibles and, you know, things like that. And, you know, people used to say that the show was like very New York. And yeah. I say, I don't think so. I, I actually feel like if you took your top 10 favorite episodes, seven or eight of them could have been held in any city or town in America. <laughs> you know, yeah, I think that's true. Because it's all about, you know, people and how they deal with each other. Yeah. You know, and small things, and we all have to deal with that stuff all the time. And we're all here in America with the same basic things available to us. Right. You know, and, and you know, people are dating and screwing up their relationships. You know, like <laughs> how is that just New York? Believe me, it's everywhere. Yeah, I no, up, I, yeah, agree. I up relationships in that in Maryland. <laughs> <laughs> do you have a uh, do you have a favorite episode? I always liked uh, the episode called "The Deal." Where Larry, where Jerry and uh, Elaine try to um, maintain their friendship and sleep with each other at the same time. Yeah, so it was perfectly about what the show is about: trying to break all the rules and create a perfect world. <laughs> and their negotiation of how they could do it, I thought, was probably the most. At the time, I was thinking this is the most well-written scene I've ever seen in sitcoms. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a really good episode. Yeah, I just love that one. Yeah, and, yeah. Know, it's, I mean, there's there's so many, but that's that's, that's the, really contest, good. the contest is pretty off the charts too. 
I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so good. It's like ridiculous. Yeah, that's uh, uh, that one still makes me just cry. I mean, a bunch of them do, but that one, it just, it makes you laugh no matter how many times you see it. Yeah. It's just, it's when he, when he slams the money on the counter, I mean, you laugh every yeah. time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, JFK, uh, you know, JFK Jr. stuff. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> just so great. So great. Well, uh, uh, Peter, thank you so much. This, this has been great. I, I've been looking forward to this one. I was uh, you know, thrilled that you agreed to come on. So this has been, uh, been a big, uh, big one for me. Well, it was my pleasure. And uh, this was really fun. And I've enjoyed looking at the backdrop behind your head. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this was, that was a game changer for me. So that's, uh, you know, we started as just a, a Facebook page, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with a bunch of, uh, you know, geeky material on there, stuff we like, you know, and, yes. and you know, I, I was using a, a little uh, room that we were doing as a studio. And then I figured out I could, I could use a backdrop and I could, I could be anywhere. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I was I'm like, why well, I'm trying to figure out how Steve Carell snuck in there amongst all these <laughs> action people. I see Steve Carell with like glasses on. Yeah. It's uh, from Anchorman. Oh, yeah. Well, maybe you should get something from, like, my dinner with Andre or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to do a movie now called My Dinner with Fauci. Oh, you should. Yeah. <laughs> that would be hilarious. I would watch that. Yeah. <laughs> they told him he should try to be more encouraging today. Yeah. So I was thinking it would be great if he goes, you know what, okay, I'll be a more encouraging from now on, social distancing, I'm reducing it from six feet to five ten. <laughs> it's, the average, it's the average American male height. I'm bringing it down to five ten. You can get a little bit closer. <laughs> Thank you. I'd watch that show. That's hilarious. Well, so um, where can people find you? Um, I'm on Twitter, Peter Melman. Uh, yep. And there's PeterMelman.com, very cleverly named website. Yeah. <laughs> we put hours and hours of thought into it. <laughs> well, and your book's uh, available on Amazon? The book is available on Amazon, or you could link it to uh, PeterMelman.com. Okay. And um, I expect them to be flying off the shelves. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You better get ready, because it's, it's coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm, going to my, I'm going to my mailbox now. Yeah, you better uh, start working on the uh, sequel. People are going to yeah. be demanding more. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm on it. I'm on it. <laughs> well, thank you so much, sir, and uh, stay well, safe. Thank and, you. This was really a pleasure, and uh, be well. Yes, sir. You thank you do as well, and hopefully uh, things will return to normal sometime soon, and then we can you know, maybe find some humor in the situation. Yeah, well, I'm glad you're hopeful. <laughs> okay take care all right sir talk to you later thank you oh, you're well all right so that was the uh great and uh, hilarious peter melman that was uh that was a lot of fun it's uh not every day that you get to talk to somebody that uh, that wrote a lot of uh you know what i think are the best episodes for uh, for seinfeld um and, and we hit on a few of them you know, I, I got I to gotta cheat a little and, and look down, but uh, just to, to give you an idea of some of the episodes that, that he's got uh, credit for. So the Virgin, uh, the Visa, uh, the Implant, Smelly Car, the Masseuse. I, I, I should have asked him about that one because I love that episode. Uh, the Wife, uh, which I think is the uh, Courtney Cox episode where she pretends to be uh, his wife. That, that's such a good one. The Hamptons. Um, Chinese woman. Uh, I, I, that's another one I really liked. Uh, uh, Scowflow, which which I think is is hilarious. And we talked about the sponge and showerhead. Um, let's see, yada yada. Uh, the maid. I, that was another one I, I wanted to ask him about. There was just so many, you know, and I didn't want to take up uh, too much of his time. And I'm sure he gets asked uh, about those all the time. But those are are such good episodes. And he talked some about. Uh, you know, some of the uh, iconic moments that, that he was responsible for. And the one 
that uh, that he didn't mention was Elaine kind of shoving Jerry and yelling uh, "Get out," which which I think is really funny. And and the episode where she's uh, with the uh, Bizarro um, Jerry and Kramer and and George and and she pushes him and says get out and he falls and and the rest of them kind of kind of get on her and and tell her it's probably better if she just leaves it's hilarious so really enjoyed that and and i hope you'll check out his book he's such a funny uh, uh writer and you know i'd love to see him uh, I, I didn't realize he was doing stand up I'd, I'd love to see him uh, in uh, in a comedy show uh, at some point so when everything settles down i'll have to uh, to keep an eye out for that hope everybody enjoyed the show you know please uh you know, do us a favor and check us out on Facebook under MeisterCon. Um, we do have a Patreon page. If uh, if you'd like to help out the show, we'd really appreciate that. It's uh, under uh, patreon.com slash MeisterCon. You know, appreciate uh, any help that you can give. And please share us with, uh, with your friends and family and anybody that you uh, uh, think would uh, enjoy the show. You know, we're, we're a father and son team and you know, we're kind of winging it, you know, doing the best we can. And, and we've been lucky enough to, to develop a pretty good uh, following. So, uh, you know, help us out with that uh, if you can. So thank you for this week. And we will see you again real soon. Bye, everybody.